Disclaimer. These videos are meant to be a brief overview of the subject. They are written to meet time constraints while still conveying factual historical information. My sources for each video are in a video summary below and can get you started on a more in-depth look at the subject. On a personal note, if there is a way to mispronounce the name, I will do it. It is a gift and I am sorry about it ahead of time. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Chancellorville, located in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, on the 30th of April through 6th of May, 1863. First, I should clarify that this battle is large and very well documented. There are many sources for this battle that include complete novel-length text. This video will not attempt to compete with those sources in our limited time. I hope if you're interested, you pursue other sources. The Union had been licking its wounds since their loss in the winter of 1862-1863. And as spring arrived, Union General Joseph Hooker of the Union Army of the Potomac journeyed out across the Rappahannock to attack the rear of General Robert E. Lee's troops. Lee received word of this movement and realizing he was at a disadvantage, with Hooker having more than double the amount of troops he had. The Confederate commander ordered his men towards the crossroads of Chancellorville to stop the Union troops. Lee being outnumbered, he knew he had to use the terrain to his advantage. Chancellorville had that. Most of the terrain was underbrush, where a smaller force could use that cover to aid their movement against a larger force. Hooker arrived at the end of April at Chancellorville and began shifting his men towards Fredericksburg, his actual target. His men approached a ridge that had a small Baptist church known locally as the Zoan Church. The church and the ridge itself were the highest ground for miles and oversaw the overgrown forest surrounding area known as the Wilderness. General Hooker felt secure that his army, the Potomac, outmassed anything the Confederates could throw at him, so he assumed they would stay in their defensive fortifications at Fredericksburg. What Hooker hadn't planned on was General Stonewall Jackson arriving with what the Confederate army could amass and challenging Hooker for the church church that was overlooking the vantage point. Stonewall Jackson caught Hooker flat-footed. He attacked Hooker viciously and drove him back towards Chancellorville. The Union advance stopped immediately and was forced to dig in and around Chancellorville crossroads. That night, in a desperate bid, Stonewall Jackson took his infantry on a 12-mile march around Hooker's army, leaving General Robert E. Lee behind with only a small fraction of men to act as a distraction for Hooker. Hooker, however, was distracted by the what he believed was the Confederate army in front of him. It took Stonewall until late afternoon on May 2nd to get to his target. Stonewall, along with 30,000 men, attacked the rear of Hooker's troops, causing confusion and mayhem. Darkness settled on May 2nd, and it was at this time that Jackson received word that Union General Hooker's flank was exposed and unprotected. Confederate chaplain Tucker Lacey, who had had a brother lived in a nearby area, provided Stonewall with a local guide to show them the area. Jackson followed the guide along with his map maker, Jed Hotchkiss, to examine the area and determine if they could maneuver around Hooker again. Unfortunately, General Stonewall Jackson's incredible string of luck ran out when he returned back to his camp. As he approached members of the Confederate 18th North Carolina Infantry, the sentries on duty heard him moving in the dark. They yelled out for him to identify himself, which he did. Unfortunately, the soldiers were spooked from the fighting earlier in the day and exhausted from the travel earlier in the morning that they opened fire before they understood his response. General Stonewall Jackson was shot in his arm. He had to have his arm amputated the next day, but fortunately for the Confederates, Confederate General Jeb Stewart was present and took over for General Jackson. With Stonewall Jackson out of action for the battle, the intensity of the battle only increased on May 3rd. Confederate forces surged and were buoyed by Confederate artillery that had amassed on Hazel Grove and allowed the tired Confederate infantry to still sweep forward and ensure a Confederate victory by the end of the day. Even with the victory, Confederates suffered a crushing defeat as General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson turned out to be mortally wounded. The sad fact it was by his own troops. It would take him eight days to die after he was evacuated at Guinea Station Plantation in Virginia. There, he died of pneumonia and complications from his wound. He died on Sunday, May 10th, and is quoted as saying, It is the Lord's Day. My wish is fulfilled. I have always desired to die on a Sunday. Jackson's death was also the first incident of forensic ballistics identification. The fatal bullet was found to be a 67 caliber bullet the type of round used by the Confederate soldiers. The Union troops were using 58 caliber rounds, much smaller and somewhat faster. This confirmed that one of the powerhouse generals for the Confederate states was slain by his own men. Losses were tragic for both sides as the Union forces lost approximately 18,000 soldiers. This included about 1,800 dead, 10,000 wounded, and 6,200 captured or missing. The Confederacy lost 12,900 soldiers. This included approximately 1,900 killed, 9,000 wounded, and 2,000 captured or missing. However, many would say the biggest loss was General Stonewall Jackson. Join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.